This is The Sim Pit. I'm your host, Sean Cole, but the real star of today's show is the entry-level sim racing chassis by Next Level Racing goes by the name Challenger. Next Level Racing is out of Australia, and they have a huge selection of sim rigs, motion platforms, wheel stands, monitor stands, and they even have keyboard holders with a variety of different price points. The Challenger is their least expensive and lowest profile full sim chassis, and I call it a full sim chassis because it actually comes with its seat. The Next Level Racing Challenger cockpit goes for $349 and is a box metal chassis that is built to accommodate drivers from 4 foot all the way up to 6 foot 9 inches tall. It is lightweight design coming in at about 52 pounds without equipment and has a center post design along with a GT style driving position. Along with the chassis, the Challenger also comes with a simple shifter mount that can be mounted in an upper or lower position as well as on the left or right hand side and it comes with its own cable management clips. The Challenger cockpit is a fairly simple design and with that it's highly adjustable. The main portion of the chassis is made of steel and has three main parts. The seat portion that elevates the seat off the ground and allows the seat to adjust back and forth on sliders moving about seven inches. The seat is very thin, it is very flat, and it can be adjusted to three predetermined reclining angles and it gets the job done in a minimalistic way. Along the left and right hand side of the seat rails are a series of holes that allow for a lower shifter mount installation with a front to back adjustability of about 14 inches. The front boxer portion of the chassis is the footwell portion of the rig and it's a few inches lower to the ground than the seat. This has a cross brace with the pedal tray mounted to that, which is very similar to other next level racing chassis that they make. It can be mounted in a forward or backward direction as much as 13 inches away or towards the driver. The entire cross brace can also be mounted in various different angles ranging from flat to about 30 degrees of incline. The wheel deck sits up on that center post design. The post is vertical and it is set in its front to back position. The height of the deck can be adjusted up and down about 8 inches and is locked into place with two large tightening knobs. The wheel deck angle can also be adjusted in angle and the shifter mount can also be installed to the side of the deck on the left or right side for the upper position mount. The Challenger cockpit also comes pre-drilled for all of what I call the common wheel and pedal sets. Everything from Logitech, Thrustmaster, and Fanatic will fit on this rig out of the box, no drilling necessary. Now, with the Next Level Racing Challenger cockpit's fairly simple design, it's actually fairly simple to assemble as well. And like all products from Next Level, I gotta say, they all come with great instructions, extra hardware, all the tools you're gonna need, and it's clearly spelled out in the instructions. In the case of the Challenger, it starts with the main upright section along with the two frontward legs and their angled tips. Each leg has its bolt pre-installed, so we remove the bolt and then bolt the legs to the upright on each side. The legs are actually marked L and R for left and right, but for some reason I missed that, so don't be a bonehead like me. Read the instructions, get it right, otherwise you'll get to the end of the rig, have to pull it apart, reverse the legs, and put it back together again. Anyway, carrying on. Step two is when we install the front cross brace between the legs with the supplied hardware. And then step three is the cross brace that will hold the pedal tray. This cross brace can be installed in one of six pre-drilled hole positions for a different angle. You also have about 13 inches of front to back to mount this piece setting your pedal position. Step four, adding the pedal tray. This tray has slots on it with four bolts and you can tighten it down to the mid cross brace. This tray can also be bolted in the front if it reaches the threaded holes and is being installed flat. In step five, we drop the center post into the upright and use two tightening knobs to hold it in place. Make sure that the top points rearward when installed. Step six, install the wheel deck. The deck's longest end faces the driver and when it is installed, you have four different angled positions to mount the deck. Step seven has us installing the two side rails for the seat. These extend backward and there's a left and right piece that can be identified by the way they overlap the front part of the stand. One bolt in the top, 
and one bolt through the side to fully attach these legs. Step eight is installing the rear cross brace with supplied hardware. Step nine has us putting the two parts of the seat together, and I will say this was the hardest part of building the entire rig. Now the brackets that come with it were both installed or built the same way, meaning they're both left or right. So I actually had to reverse the way one of them was built together, and then I could assemble the seat, which starts with removing the seat bolts from the seat and then installing the left bracket to the left side with that hardware already on the seat bottom doing the same thing on the opposite side, and then bringing in the seat back and attaching it with its three bolts onto the top of the brackets. The hinge point has three different positions for the seat back angle. Step 10 has us installing the seat sliders to the chassis. It is important to have the adjuster facing forward and you will need to slide the rails to access the mounting holes to install them to the rails. For step 11, you will want to get the seat rails into a similar position and then put the seat on top of the rails and then you bolt the seat rails to the seat bottom. Again, you might need to slide the seat forward or backward to access all of the holes and get things aligned properly. Steps 12 and 13 both involve the shifter mount. There are extra brackets that can be used that will raise or lower the mount slightly if it is being mounted to the chassis side. Step 14 has us adding the adjustable feet to the bottom. Six in total and that completes building the rig other than you will want to remove that protective film to have the nice glossy stickers at the ready, ready to go. However, if we look back to step four when we installed the pedal tray, I mentioned the top bolts if they reach and being able to mount them in. The other part of that is if you're using an angled pedal tray, they actually give you long belt bolts. So if you're using it in a position that actually reaches, which I couldn't be any further this way and still reach it, you can actually bolt those in and then mount your pedals and it is very secure. The installation of common sim gear onto the Challenger cockpit is going to be very easy. Basically, if it's made by Logitech, Thrustmaster, or Fnatic, it's just going to bolt right onto the chassis. It's that easy. In my case, I was using a Thrustmaster TGT for my testing. I figured it was a good, suitable wheel for the rig, and the install was as simple as it can be done. I used the Thrustmaster TGT specific bolt, but the Challenger even came with mounting hardware if you needed it. Two bolts later, the wheel was installed. The pedals went on just as easily. There's a series of slots in the pedal tray going left to right. The spacing on these will work for any common pedal set and even gives you a bit of different positions to choose from. Two bolts later for the Thrustmaster pedals and we're all set up ready to go. That is except for the cable management and it did come with its own clips to be able to attach the wires to the posts. However, I didn't have very good luck with those. I ended up throwing them away and using my own Velcro straps. Now, one of the advantages of the Challenger cockpit is it is highly adjustable despite being in an expensive rig. Now, it starts with the wheel deck. The wheel deck is in a fixed position. You cannot move this front to back. You can change the height and angle, but this is a fixed position and it's gonna determine a lot of things. So the next adjustment is gonna be moving the seat to exactly where you need it to be for where your wheel is and then adjusting the pedals. For the wheel deck, I preferred the angle adjustment that left the deck mostly flat, which allows for three bolts locking it down in place most firmly. I then lowered the deck to the right height and then moved on to the pedals. Having driven so many rigs in this type of driving position, I had a hunch that I would want my pedals at an incline, and I had built it that way when I assembled the rig. However, with the pedals mounted and my seat slid to the proper distance for the wheel, it had my pedals a little further than I desired. So I adjusted the cross brace a little bit closer to me and ended up getting everything just perfect. Now with all the components installed, I think back to at the beginning when I called it a GT driving position. I have to say, once I got it all dialed in, it's almost more of a hybrid type of a driving position. With the pedals at an aggressive angle, your feet are not that much lower than your butt in a direction towards more of a Formula One lay down position. However, I was more comfortable with my seat in a more upright position, much more towards a GT driving position. In the end, it was fairly comfortable 
and a position that allowed for great driving. I also found the center post to be a little less in my way than other rigs that I've tested, other center post rigs that I've tested in the past, which is a nice change. Now, when it comes to the driving aspects of testing the next level racing Challenger cockpit, it all starts with getting in and out. The Challenger, it's a low slung, very low to the ground rig, and that makes getting in and out a little bit of a challenge. With it also being a center post design, it means a little extra wiggle to work your way into the rig. Once settled in, the driving position was pretty good. I was very happy with my wheel placement and angle, and despite being a center post design, I found that it barely interfered with my pedal operation. The pedal placement was also very good. The right distance and an angle that I could work with very well. When strictly focusing on our seated position, the seat itself comes into play. The seat is lightly cushioned, and I can't say that it is uncomfortable, but it is less form-fitting than higher-end seats. I was also able to drive in it for hours without discomfort, but it is a minimalistic seat. With the seat being on sliding rails, it did allow for a perfect position, and it can be slid back in order to make getting in and out a little bit easier. Turning our attention to the pedal tray, it is perhaps the best aspect of the entire rig. Number one, it's drilled for almost any pedals. And it's slotted for lots of left to right adjustment, allowing for centering the center post between the gas and brake for left foot breakers. The angle adjustment also allows for the best placement of the pedals. And then to top it off, it has an extra support bolt to add stability. The end result is a pedal tray or setup that can rival much more expensive rigs. It is stiff enough. The tray metal is fairly thin, but it resists flexing well. There is a hint of movement when looking at it with a close-up camera, but you don't really feel that flex or movement at all under your foot. The wheel deck rises up on its center post between your legs. All of the adjustments and mounting allowed for it to be exactly where I'd want it to be in this driving position. Under the rigors of sim racing, we push, we pull, we twist, we turn on our wheels when we drive. The next level racing Challenger cockpit does its best to fight those forces. But with its center post design, that is asking a lot. The Challenger does a better job of resisting the left to right movement better than I expected. And that is great as it is the most noticeable and distracting of wheel deck movements. However, there is a bit of movement in the front to back direction under load. When pushing and pulling on the wheel, you will see the wheel moving away and towards you while driving. It's not to the point of loose or feeling detached, but it's enough to measure. The wheel deck also allows for a little bit of twist, not in the direction of the wheels turning, but more in the looking top down angle, it twists slightly under load. When blasting through chicanes or making big saves with quick counter steering, is when you feel this movement the most. It didn't prevent me from driving well and making those saves, but it could not compare to a more substantial rig or a real car in that way. When comparing the Challenger to more substantial rigs, even from next level racing, like the GT Track or the FGT chassis, that is a whole lot of wheel deck movement. But when compared to those more substantial rigs, this thing's a lightweight in price, in weight, and in its footprint. The amount of movement will be too much for seasoned racers who demand perfection from their rigs. But for most entry-level racers, on less powerful wheels, it will be a good starting point. All of the adjustments of the Challenger held strong and stayed in place, which is great for a lightweight rig. The Challenger cockpit is also very easy to adjust. Like if you have guests come over, undo the knobs, you can move the wheel deck wherever you need it to do, do the seat slider and you can adjust it for just about anybody who comes in very quick and easy. Now, when you think about a $350 rig, I don't think of it coming with a shifter mount, but this one does come and I do think of that as an extra. And I didn't test it right out of the gate, but when I did put it on, I wanted to put it down in that seat rail position versus up on the wheel deck. You have a lot of adjustability front to back. However, I did find it to be a little bit low, but in an adequate for shifting position. The shifter mount itself is fairly stiff. Under the load of shifting, there's a slight up and down wiggle that occurs, but it is not felt at all when shifting, only noticed on the camera. 
At this point, we've covered the cost and features of the Next Level Racing Challenger cockpit. We've talked about its assembly. We've talked about its adjustment and installing all of our gear. We've even talked about dialing it in for us and getting out there and driving it. But just to be perfectly clear, let's break it down with the good, the not so good, and the bottom line, starting off with the good. And that being that it's inexpensive for a full chassis. Better than a wheel stand. Highly adjustable. Sliding seat, a bonus for an inexpensive rig. Shifter mount included. Lightweight for a full chassis. Small footprint for a full chassis. Pre-drilled for common equipment. Logitech, Thrustmaster, Fanatic. Will fit just about any size driver. Simple assembly, good instructions. Extra hardware for the rig includes mounting hardware for that common sim gear. And now on to the not so good, the wobble of the wheel deck. Center post design, not my favorite. Seat, not well padded. Seat is very flat. Low to the ground, can be hard to get in and out of. Cable clips suck, Velcro just works better. Seat wobbles when pushed on from behind. Can't feel while driving. And now on to the bottom line. The Next Level Racing Challenger cockpit is built to be an entry level chassis. At 350 bucks, it's just barely more expensive than some of the more premium wheel stands out there, yet it's a full chassis. It actually comes with a seat and it is pre-drilled or adaptable for all the common sim racing out there, making it a perfect entry level rig. Granted, it wobbles a little bit and when compared to more premium rigs, it kind of looks a little cheap. And you know what? It is a little cheap and that again makes it a perfect option for entry level racers and it means that hardcore people definitely aren't even going to be interested in this rig. It's not their niche. It's a different level. It's perfectly suited for somebody who's on a budget or looking for something with a very, very small lightweight footprint. So to a hardcore sim racer, this isn't even considered an option. And even Next Level Racing admits this being that this is their entry level rig. They make a rig at a more expensive price point as well. They're just acknowledging the entry level market. And when you consider, you take this rig for 350 bucks. I've seen a G29 for as little as $250 on sale. And for $600, you have something that's plug and play into your Xbox and PlayStation, depending on which G you bought, bought and it's going to be PC compatible. If you have a PC computer ready to go, you're not going to get it much cheaper than 600 bucks ready to go with a setup that can win races. A lot of us, we spent more than 600 bucks on our rigs alone. So for that market, the entry level market, I think next level racing has hit a home run at $350. You're not gonna be able to do much better. So if you want more information on the Challenger cockpit, head over to nextlevelracing.com. You can get everything that they said about it. If you have any questions of me, of course, email me, Sean, S-H-A-U-N, at thesimpit.com, and I'd be glad to answer your questions. That's going to do it for this one. Be sure to thumbs up if you like the show. Be sure to tell a friend so that we can grow. Be sure to subscribe so that you can get advanced notifications of new shows when they come out. This is The Sim Pit. I'm Sean Cole, and I'll see you on the track.